Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Your Mark on the World Show. We've got Felix Ortiz, the CEO and founder of Veritas Learning today. We're talking about how uh, Veritas is helping companies hire better, how he's helping students get better jobs. You don't want to miss this episode. Welcome to Your Mark on the World, bringing you another change maker with champion of social good, Devin D. Thorpe. Felix, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Well, we're thrilled to have you. Uh, I, I'm trying to picture myself as a uh, college student uh, looking for a job, and I stumble across Veritas. Tell me what it is and why I should be using it. So what, what Veritas is, it's a, uh, a, a SaaS platform that allows a student uh, to generate a verified skilled record, which we call the skill passport, and enables them to be empowered uh, to map to the proper skills to end up with a job in today's marketplace. How does the passport, uh, the skill passport, differ from a transcript? So uh, at Everest, what we're doing is we're focused on a skills-based uh, economy. So uh, taking lifelong experience, um, whether you're a veteran, or even you have had uh, you know tough experiences growing up. Th those are all uh, foundational soft skills, such as grit. You know, people are trying to teach grit today, and uh, yeah, I would I would argue that it's hard to teach grit unless you've experienced uh, some some hardships. Uh, and and those all add to a skill. Uh, and we keep overlooking those foundational skills because we're so focused on the degree uh, certificate versus a skills actual that can lead you towards uh, employability and mobility. Uh, so, so that's really what our emphasis with the skill password is to enable the mobility of all the skills that you compile in a verified way and store it in a record that takes you throughout your journey to employment. How do employers use the platform and the skills passport? How do they use it? Yeah, so basically uh, an, an employer... Uh, uh, you know, uses it in the following manner. Uh, many employers have developed university relations team and uh, have a typical operational structure when it comes to recruitment. Uh, there's obviously AI and all this stuff going on in the market. But more often than not, employers are overlooking a very critical pipeline of talent that will help resolve this issue of the 6.7 million jobs that exist in America open today. Uh, and that's a non-traditional pipeline of talent, right? How can we get uh, tight, uh, tight pipeline of talent in a very quick manner uh, in other ways. And so we, uh, as an employer, what they're able to do is access this non-traditional pipeline, whether they're coming through a community college, a workforce board, an NGO, uh, you know, foster the foundational skills that they have, and then map that internally against their workforce plans and skills uh, needed, uh, which then allows the employer to have a more loyal workforce because these folks have been given an opportunity and to continue mobility from within. Uh, it's uh, it sounds like a great tool. Uh, I think you have a special interest in helping uh, underserved communities. Uh, how does this platform help them? Yeah, so you know, the, really, the genesis of British started uh, with my own experience. You know, my parents migrated here. Uh, we lived in a crammed apartment in Brooklyn uh, at a time when no one wanted to live in Brooklyn. Uh, and, um, and, and really, uh, early on, it was instilled in me the association of skills with employment. I saw my parents and, you know, do it. And they went from a crammed house to eventually their own house. And so, it, so for these folks that are, are not having the opportunity that are being overlooked just because they enter a community college or in a workforce board that oftentimes, you know, employers might say, you know, they're very entry level. We'll give them hourly wage. What, what we're looking to do is rem remove that bias. Uh, and change the mind that, you know, you can have uh, an individual user uh, that has a skills-based model that can end up making $50,000 a year versus making it hourly. And so for us, we're focused on three KPIs, economic mobility, uh, income mobility, and really holding accountability uh, of, you know, the ecosystem. We talked a little bit about how employers and how students use the platform, but I think there's a third player in there as well, and that's the college or university. Tell us how they use the platform and uh, what it does for them. Yeah, so the value for the, for the higher educational institution is around really around accountability. 
they get to understand, you know, I spend this dollar on a curriculum. What is it associated with to allowing our students to get employed? Um, more often than not, the curriculum is misaligned and uh, that money is being you know, misutilized, right? Because they're, they're training people for things that aren't relevant. Uh, the second piece is the accountability on income tracking. You know, many states, as you know, have longitudinal data systems, uh, but often and more than not, that data is inaccurate. It's not uh, very individualized or, uh, and be, or, or customized. And so we enable uh, the unique uh, accountability around that income. Uh, and then the last piece of that is skills uh, mapping. So mapping against the skills uh, that are required for XYZ company into a local XYZ college in a specific region. Uh, so that's, that's how they use it. Are you able to uh, allow the university to use its existing data flows to populate your system or is additional manual entry uh, required? So we're, we're focused on automation. So, uh, you know, we're, we're taking these data configuration models that they have and mapping it uh, via either an FTP secured server or direct API integration. So, you know, in some case, in most cases, they were, they're, they're, they're existing models. We, we upgrade and map that accordingly. So, so no one is at the college typing in that uh, Sally learned how to uh, code this week. Yeah. Right? Uh, no. Yeah. So, um, what are some of the use cases that you have seen where there's been an impact that you're proud of? Yeah, you know, when we first started, we started with the formerly incarcerated community because we knew that if we can um, uh, impact those lives and our algorithms can work with them, then they can work with, with pretty much anybody. Uh, so we started with 5,000 uh, formerly incarcerated uh, in, in New York, actually. Uh, we mapped 70 of those, 70 percent of those into employment. Um, and 62% retention rate. Uh, the hour, the the salary went from, that these folks had were around 18 to 21 thousand dollars before going through a program. After that, it was around 32 to 33 thousand dollars. So we made a pretty significant increase in their in their lives, uh, and then they continue to get retained in the workforce the year out. Um, after that, we we then decided to say, okay, well, can we map this and, and test this with community colleges and workforce boards? Um, and so we started to do uh, pilots in San Jose City uh, with San Jose City College. Uh, they were one of our first early higher ed partners. Um, and I think we started with a thousand alumni. So that was one of the more difficult challenges because we had to start with the alumni. Uh, most community colleges don't have good record keeping of their alumni. Uh, so that was you know, quite a task. Uh, and it was focused on IT. Um, and what uh, and so that you know that proved to to be well uh, and and now we're expanding throughout that whole region. Uh, what what that has led us to is that really mobilizing the effort on removing the barrier of a four year degree bias on the IT uh, recruitment world uh, and focusing it on a skills based uh, requirement uh, so that these kids can also be employable in these Silicon Valley companies, uh, which it also ties into the diversity plan that these employers have. It is interesting uh, in this world we live in uh, to think about the how many jobs require skills, uh, significant skills, more so than it seems to me a generation or two ago when uh, a lot of people could earn a good living um, in, uh, you know, working in uh, manufacturing jobs that didn't require as much skill. Uh, uh, this seems like a great adaptation for uh, today's environment. Uh, what are you seeing in that regard? You know, I, I think uh, what, what we're seeing from the early employers that we're working with is that they realize that they have a problem. And the problem is that they can't find the talent. And, and the narrative for the last many years, uh, I'm sure, you know, for a while, has been around that this is a degree-based issue. Uh, any data that you see will say, well, if you get a degree, you're going to earn thirty or fifty thousand dollars more. The reality is that if you look at the, the high, some of the highest earners in Silicon Valley, they don't even have a degree; they have a skill in coding, uh, and they're making a couple of hundred thousand dollars plus stock. So why can't we give the same opportunity to kids that you know are not going through tier one or dropping out of tier one institutions? Um, so for me uh, and for us, it was really honing in to see can we change the mindset in some of the more old older minded thinking 
because as higher ed changes, also employers have to change. Uh, and so when we positioned it as a skills-based economy, uh, it, it became more fluid and, 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 you know, and tied into the work that these employers want to, not just from an apprenticeship standpoint, but also from a talent acquisition and mobility standpoint. I've seen um, in the last few years uh, a almost an explosion, but certainly a, a proliferation of 90-day program that teach people to code. Uh, and I've seen them advertised uh, as anywhere from almost sort of rudimentary, get an entry-level tech job in, you know, uh, database management or, or, or something basic, uh, all the way up to, you know, in 90 days we'll make you a full-stack coder. Uh, what's your take on these programs, and do you see yourself integrating with, with these programs as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think those programs are built with good intention. I think there's a little oversaturation. I mean, I, I see programs now that are costing ten thousand dollars. So it's still not, it's not, it's not eradicating the cost issue uh, for skills, right? Um, the question is, how can you retain skills without having too much debt burden? Um, and so I, you know, the, what 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 we believe uh, will will occur and how we tie in is that you'll have a foundational skill set that lines up against the foundational skill that an employer needs. And then the employer will internally build out their apprenticeship program so that you have a specific uh, build out of skills for that employer, allowing you as an employer to retain talent without you ris risking the ability for Felix to move to another company because of the fact he has a uh, overall you know, skill that can hit across the board uh, and you can continue to hire from within. So it, it, it mitigates the risk for the employer to have to worry about retention when they can focus on skilling up uh, and then also allows them to, uh, invest even more effectively uh, their dollars when it comes to their internal apprenticeship programs. So I see us integrating uh, as part of our, you know, uh, of our skill passport. Excellent. Well, Felix, you've had an extraordinary uh, career for a young guy. Uh, what's the most important lesson you've learned over your career? You know, um, I, I can tell you a story that one time I was down to a dollar in my bank and we had to make a payroll of $150,000. <laughs> And, and, uh, and, and that was, you know, uh, pr pretty scary, you know, when, when you're facing that and you're, you're holding the livelihood of people. And um, I remember I, I, I went down uh, to, <laughs> to the apartment in Miami and I looked at the water every day. I would wake up with stomach ache, go to bed with a stomach ache, thinking like, man, if, if, if I can get through this. What, what took over was my military training, uh, the ability to maintain my, uh, my, my calmness and composure throughout and, and not giving up and having that determination and grit. Um, so I think, you know, what, what that taught to me was that no matter how difficult, uh, it gets when you're doing something that's going to change something, uh, you're going to go through that level of, 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 you know, testing to see if you can handle it. Uh, so, you know, that, that's pretty much, it. it's a mental mindset. You could be doing anything and yet, uh, you launched this business, uh, with a really, um, uh, social mission in mind uh, to, to help first you started with uh, formerly incarcerated individuals you've worked with uh, a focus on helping veterans uh, and other underserved populations uh, why why was that so important to you yeah it goes back to uh, you know to, to my childhood um, yeah, I saw my, my parents, you know, uh, skills and movement to forward, you know, uh, evolution of us getting our own home. Um, I want that opportunity for everybody. You know, we, we shouldn't be limiting the ability for me to be a tech founder just because uh, I have connected with certain people. If you're good enough, you should have the opportunity to be uh, given to you or provided at least a possibility. Um, and so for me, I, I'm really focused on you know, how can we enable everyone's greatness by giving them the opportunity to do so? Uh, and, and that's how I live my life. And, and I think if we can do that, we can make society better. What is your superpower, Felix? Not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of us would like that superpower. Listen, <laughs> Felix, we appreciate you taking the time to be with us today and uh, congratulate you on your great work. I know you're busy. In fact, I think you just got off an airplane. Uh, but before you go, would you take a minute and just tell people how they can learn more about Veritas and how they can connect with you personally? 
Sure. Yeah. They can follow us on Twitter at, at Viridis, V-I-R-I-D-I-S, or they can uh, check us out at viriduslearning.com. Fantastic. Well, Felix, again, we wish you every success in the work that you're doing to uh, help people get better jobs. All right. Thank you. All right. Have a wonderful day. All righty. Let's do some good. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening. This podcast was recorded via Google Hangouts on Air and is available at youtube.com forward slash Devinthorpe. Subscribe to this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes by searching for Your Mark on the World. Every weekday, Devin hosts a CEO, celebrity, entrepreneur, or other changemaker here on the Your Mark on the World show to inspire and prepare you to make your mark. Devin is a champion of social good, writing about, advocating for, and advising people who are doing good. He is a Forbes contributor who is a recognized thought leader in social entrepreneurship, impact investing, and crowdfunding. To book Devin as a speaker, visit devinthorpe.com. Learn more about Devin's work at yourmarkontheworld.com.